Written by five no-sleep authors, Storming Area 51, Horror at the Gate. It's available for purchase on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. A war between the aliens that crash-landed here in 1947 and the government that has conspired to keep them here has begun. For years, they've been planning infiltrating the human race and waiting for the right moment. That moment has finally come. When the gates go down, they make their move, and these five humans will be caught in the crossfire. It started as a little bit of harmless voyeurism. A silly, guilty pleasure that I thought I would get bored with or feel guilty enough to stop. Instead, I found myself obsessing over the little screen and the beautiful woman with the long black hair for weeks, secretly wishing I could become her, even just for one day. <laughs> what would lead me to wish that, you ask? Well, the short answer is motherhood. You see, 11 months ago, my twins were born, and although it was the happiest day of my life, I was ill-prepared for what would happen next. I love my boys. They're the fire that sparks my soul, the reason I do anything, but life as a mother was much harder than I had imagined. The first few months were rough, to put it mildly. I had a fair helping of postpartum, issues with breastfeeding, uh, and then the soul-crushing guilt when we switched to formula. And top that off with feeling like my body wasn't mine anymore and less than three hours sleep a night and <laughs> I was a wreck. And so was my marriage. So when I put the boys down for their nap that day two months ago and the video monitor beeped, alerting me that there was movement on the second channel, I hit the button without even thinking. It didn't occur to me at that moment in time that we didn't have a second camera or had even used the second channel before. Like everything else in my life, <laughs> I was just doing what the little screen told me to do. And there she was, in full HD glory, a beautiful woman with long, flowing black hair like young, delicious Penelope Cruz, perched on top of a slate gray counter, silk floral robe draped across her shoulders and legs spread wide. Her back was turned towards the camera, which was angled high above the small Eden kitchen giving a full view all the way into the open, planned living room. I could see her writhing, her head falling back as she arched her body, her black hair cascading around her. I would like to say that in that moment, I had no idea what was going on, but I did. I had seen that look before. Hell, I'd been that young woman once, full of sexual desire and vitality, I watched with bated breath, mouth agape as the show continued. To my disappointment, there was no sound filtering through the speakers, just the crystal clear video feed. A man slowly stood up from between her thighs, slinked to his hands around her, and kissed her feverishly. Oh, he was gorgeous, tall and thick in all the right places, like a lumberjack wet dream. A high-pitched wail broke the trance, which was soon followed by a second cry. I switched the monitor back onto the first channel that showed both boys sitting up in their cribs, playing with their toes and garbling back and forth to each other. I evaluated the situation and decided I probably had ten minutes max before all hell broke loose, and I had to grab them. So I quickly hit the button and switched back to the second channel, hoping to catch the rest of the show. The screen was depressingly void of the couple leaving me with only a glimpse of a large man in jeans and heavy work boots walking out of frame down the hallway. It looked like Penelope and her man had decided to make their way to the bedroom for the rest of their encounter. I sighed. It was for the best, I suppose. The boys were ready to get up, and I still had to clean up after lunch and get dinner together. Oh, God, not to mention three loads of laundry to fold. I didn't exactly have time to sit here and spy on strangers, no matter how much I wanted to. For the next eight weeks, I watched the video feed of Penelope. In her silk robe, entertain men, one after the other. There was the burly man on Wednesdays that had a mop of red hair and a hipster beard that liked to take his pleasure on the same counter I had first seen Penelope with Friday's man. He liked it rough, and by the looks of it, she didn't mind. Monday was my least favorite, that was the man in the suit. 
he would come in and stand in the living room, facing the kitchen, and have her undress him. Shoes first, but always leaving the tie on. She would then walk him down the hall like a dog on a leash and disappear from view. Day in and day out, like clockwork, there was a new man for every weekday. I had counted eight in rotation, with the exception of Boots. Boots was present in every single episode I had watched so far. However, I had never seen his face, and he always seemed to avoid being fully in frame, never showing up until the room was clear of both Penelope and her daily lover. In my mind, he was her pimp, or her bodyguard, always there, watching, just like I was, hidden in the background, unseen, but always there. I am ashamed to say I found myself staying around the house more often than not doing indoor activities with the boys instead of going to the park or running around the backyard, never wanting to be too far away from the monitor and somehow miss an episode, like it was a pornographic soap opera and I was its biggest fan. I went as far as buying a small blow-up ball pit that fits perfectly in the living room so the boys could play in it safely and entertain themselves during the times I couldn't get them both down for a nap when it was time for my show to start and the monitor beeped. I learned pretty quickly that the channel went live around the same time every day. 2.05 p.m. on the dot, which made it easy to plan our schedules around showtime. Strangely enough, with the added pep in my step, my marriage started turning around for the better as well, and my husband Mark noticed. After a long night of kinky adult play where I had pulled out some moves I had seen Penelope and Friday's man used, he finally got the nerve to ask me what had gotten into me lately. I joked and said, You are, and gave him a silly smile, trying to brush the question off with a joke. But he wouldn't relent. And I found myself realizing that the reason I hadn't told him was because I had kept this dirty secret for so long and that I felt guilty about it. I, yeah, I felt bad for spying on this person and invading her personal privacy. But as silly as it sounds, it was keeping the secret from Mark, my partner of 10 years, that was making me feel awful. I was so embarrassed. I told him all about it every sordid detail of what I had seen over the last two months. To my surprise, instead of disgust, he seemed interested, excited almost, asking to see for himself. But he was also a little disturbed about how our monitor was picking up someone else's feed. You see, we don't have a monitor that connects to the internet. It isn't like a, a smart monitor that you can view on your phone or from a website. It's radio frequency only for the exact reason that we didn't want anyone to be able to hack into the monitor and spy on our children. Well, I shouldn't be able to see someone else's feeds, just like they shouldn't be able to see mine. It's on a totally different frequency. He went into a lot more detail, but I wasn't really listening because I had already grabbed the monitor, planning on showing him the second channel feature. Although the light wasn't on, I figured we could flip over and at least show him the kitchen. But when I turned it on, I was surprised to see not only could I not access Penelope's kitchen, but there was no second channel feature at all. I was alone in the kitchen with the boys, having lunch the next day, when the light flashed again, letting me know the second channel was working. Confused, I checked my cell, the time showing 1.02pm. That was earlier than usual for the second channel to be live, I thought. The boys were safely buckled into their high chairs, eating leftover spaghetti and peas. With a lunch like this, it ended up turning into a messy art lesson where I let them play while I finish up dishes, so I figured there was no harm in giving myself a break while they played and ate. I grabbed the monitor and hit the button, making sure to move the screen away from their little eyes, and the second channel lit up. It was exactly as it had done for the last few weeks and I let go a sigh of relief and made a mental note to tell Mark it was working again. Penelope was seated in the far corner of the screen, lounging in a luxurious rose-printed high-backed chair in her living room. The kind you see in magazines but would never actually buy. She was wearing the same silk floral robe she always wore, her hair tousled as if she had just gotten out of bed. 
I shook my head, laughing at the fact that I was sitting here spying on this poor woman who was just hanging out at home doing nothing, when I saw her jump up from the seat and race towards the kitchen and out of view down the hallway. I jerked up in response, sitting higher in my chair and leaned towards the monitor until I was only inches away. Moments later, Penelope raced back into view, and she looked frightened, her eyes wide and her mouth opened in a silent scream. She moved below the camera, out of view, and I, I could only assume it was another row of counters along the wall because when she emerged back into frame, she was holding a large butcher knife. She held the knife in front of her, her arms shaking as she gripped it in both hands. For a moment, it reminded me of a cheesy 90s horror movie where the lead sexy lady stood her ground against the serial killer. But this was no movie. A dark shadow filled the hallway inching closer and closer to her until a large form emerged. It was a man. I'd seen him before, or at least glimpses of him. That was Boots, her bodyguard that was always around. I could tell by the giant work boots and frayed jeans he always wore, the only actual part of him I had fully seen. He looked different from what I had imagined. His face was clean-shaven with small, deep-set eyes, his features strangely round, almost feminine? It's far less intimidating than I expected for a bodyguard. But why was she terrified of her security guard? Maybe he had to take care of a rowdy John and she was worried the other guy would get in past him? He moved another step towards her and she stepped back, mirroring his movements. I could see her face now. She was screaming at him, waving her arms frantically, the knife in her right hand as she used her left to point towards the door, yelling at him to get out. But he wasn't leaving. He was getting closer. He leapt towards her, his body moving much faster than it should have, knocking the knife easily across the room and out of reach. When he reached her, his body had shifted, morphing during the short distance into something I had never seen before. His back bent at an impossible angle. His clothes ripped away as his body doubled in size, becoming a beast of pure muscle and sinew his old skin slopping away in a wet pile below him, like a snake shedding skin. His head reared back, mouth reticulated open like that of a python as he stretched to his full height, at least eight feet tall, almost hitting the ceiling. I could see horns emerge from his skull like a ram, and he breathed heavily, his chest expanding with every breath. She didn't wait for him to finish his change. She bolted towards the glass sliding doors, trying to wrench them open, but they were locked. She fumbled for the latch, but gave up as he started towards her and ran past him just in the nick of time, barely escaping his talon clutches as he landed against the doors only a second behind her. She raced into the living room, grabbing a marbled Buddha statue off the coffee table to use as a weapon. It pursued her, only steps away. She quickly jumped onto the high back chair, turning quickly as she launched herself at it. Wielding the statue above her head, she brought it down hard on its skull. Had it been a normal man, it would have killed him instantly. But this wasn't a normal man. It was a beast. A silent scream filled the room. Even without sound, I could tell it was filled with rage and terror. The beast reached out just as she turned to flee towards the hallway, grabbing her shoulder and violently tossing her into the large entertainment center along the wall, her body smashing through the glass panels and falling onto the ground below. Splinters of wood and broken glass was strewn throughout her hair and along her body. I saw her try to get up, her right arm limp beneath her. I had seen enough. I needed to do something. I grabbed my cell and frantically called 911, shocked the time only read 1.07 p.m. Had it really only been five minutes since this all began? I mentally prepared myself for what I had to say. I knew I couldn't tell them what was happening. <laughs> they would think it was a prank call, but I could let them know someone was being violently attacked. It took a moment to explain the situation to the operator, but thankfully he did not question why I was able to pick up a neighboring security feed on the baby monitor and advised that they would send over an officer to my house immediately to view the monitor themselves. I just had to wait. I stressed how urgent it was, hoping that the sound of sirens would lure the beast away, but knew in my heart they wouldn't make it on time to save Penelope. Panic gripping my voice now as I watched the beast begin kicking her with a force that sent her tumbling towards the kitchen and closer to the camera. A pool of blood stained the white 
marble tiles in the living room, his heavy boots leaving large, bloody prints behind him. He picked up the fallen statue, raised it over his head, and brought it down hard. Forgetting my children were blissfully playing in spaghetti beside me, forgetting that I had the phone still gripped in my hand, I screamed. I couldn't hear the sickening crunch of her skull caving in beneath the weight, but I felt it. My whole body reacted as I watched her body twitch in a dance of death. It was then that something happened that I can't explain, and I will never forget. The beast stopped, dead in his tracks looked up at the monitor, and smiled at me. Before I knew, the beast moved, too quickly to track on the screen, and the next moment its face was all I could see. Large yellow eyes with stared pupils that I had never seen before looked at me through the monitor. It stayed like that for three seconds, face splattered in Penelope's blood, wickedly smiling at me. And then it spoke. I may not have been able to hear it, but I understood it nonetheless. It was clear as day, his voice echoing in my mind as if he had shouted it. I can see you, Elizabeth. I'm coming for you next. I sat there, terrified, too afraid to move. I could hear the voice on the phone asking if everything was okay, but I couldn't respond. What could I say? There was a monster watching me through a camera in the dead lady's apartment? <laughs> no, I did the only thing I could think of. I hung up the phone, grabbed the boys, and got the fuck out of the house. Thank God Mark always makes me keep a fully stocked diaper bag in the car with a change of clothes and diapers because I didn't even think. I just ran. I've been on the road for hours, and I just stopped for gas and a much-needed coffee. The boys are still passed out in their car seats, still covered in dried spaghetti, but safe for now. I haven't even had the courage to call Mark yet. I'm too scared he won't believe me and demand that I come home, but I can't do that. Not with that beast after me, even if it means doing this alone. Which brings me here to you. I'm looking for someone that might have some information, someone that knows what the fuck this thing is and how to kill it for good. Because there is no way... I'm going to let that thing get near my boys, not even over my dead body. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video. Because this is October, I'm going to make this nice, short, and sweet. If you'd like to help support the show or the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. If you'd like to get yourself some new Halloween and creepypasta inspired teas, you can head over to etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And if you want to catch me, Creeps McPasta, and Mew during our live Halloween tour around the southern U.S., head over to creepypasta.showfetty.com. That's creepypasta.s-h-o-f-e-t-t-i.com. Hang on to your hats, kids, because this year is a 31-day Halloween countdown. Happy Halloween, and sweet dreams.